قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise belongs to Allah the Lord of the worlds, and may the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon his final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters from Gothenburg and possibly beyond, um, it is a great privilege and honor for me to be here with you. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us all on this evening and allow us to benefit from one another insha'Allah ta'ala now <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose us to be from the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this ummah to be the best ummah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas that you were the best of nations raised up amongst mankind. Why? What makes us the best ummah? Because you command the good, you forbid the evil, and you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember these three things. You command the good. You uphold the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, that you forbid the evil. Anything that is wrong, anything that is a form of disobedience, you say that it is wrong. And that you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There will be no ummah, no nation to come after this ummah. The responsibility is upon us to teach people, to show people how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala following in the footsteps of our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what is upon us. So why is it that we find, not just in Sweden, but in many places around the world, you find that many of the youth, many of the Muslim youth, that they are involved in crime, criminality, seeking to be, if you like, gangsters, or in simple words, mujrimun. They want to be criminals. So we have to ask ourselves, why is it that they aspire to be a criminal? Now, a criminal will not call themselves a criminal. They will see themselves as something else. But what makes a person want to do essentially a haram? Because to understand, to understand this issue, because it is a, a big problem that we have, that a lot of our youth, our youngsters are somehow attracted to this way of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that we should be these types of people. However, a Muslim within themselves has tried or has decide, decided they want to live a different way, the complete opposite. Allah jalla wa ala tells us this, this is haram. But this person says, I don't care. I want to deal in this. I want to sell this. I want to drink this. What makes a person want to do that? If we break the issue down, it becomes very simple. There are those people who live for this life and live for this life alone. That they will seek a happiness in this life alone. And then there are others who, yes, of course, they will seek happiness in this life. But ultimately, they know that the real happiness lies in the next life. Because that will be for eternity. That will be forever. Not just the blink of an eye that we exist in this worldly life. And you can say maybe there's a third category. I mean, you can break it down in different ways. The third category is that the person believes that they can do what they like now 
and that they'll face the consequences and that maybe they believe that they will be okay in the hereafter. So they will commit the haram and then they will say that I will make tawbah later. Or they don't think about the consequences of their sins. They don't think about the evil that they are doing. So what is it that pushes our youngsters, especially our youngsters, towards criminality, this gangster way of life, and falling into haram? There are a number of different factors. And in fact, this is a research or a topic, if you like, that is beyond our scope on a worldly level. Because people, they study, why do youth fall into crime in the first place? Not just Muslims. Why do youth fall into crime? Is it a lack of education? Okay. Is it um, factors like not finding a job? Is it places where they live in poverty, for example? Do these have an impact on the person wanting to find, wanting to find some way out? Because they believe in their lives, they believe in their lives that they haven't achieved or that they cannot achieve. They're not able to achieve. So therefore, they need to take a shortcut. So people believe that they don't have much of a chance in life. Therefore, they have to take a shortcut. They have to take a shortcut. And that shortcut is into crime. That, for example, to become a doctor, you have to study maybe six to eight years. To become a consultant, maybe another four. Maybe 12 years and all for you to become a consultant, a specialist, or a dentist, or a lawyer, or something which requires years of study. You don't have time for that. You need, you need the happiness now. You need it to happen now. Why should I study all of these years? And then, of course, mashallah, they, do good, they make good money, mashallah. But I don't have time. I don't have 12 years to spend of my life studying to make that money if I make it, if I, if I finish. I want the money now because that money will make me happy. That the shaitan has deceived that person in believing that happiness, contentment, lies getting money or having power or having control. The shaitan has deceived that person in thinking this is the way to be happy. And essentially, subhanAllah, everything that walks on this earth, everything that breathes, whether it's on land or in the sea, is seeking some form of happiness. Some form of happiness. Eating will make you happy. Okay, having some money, buying something will make you happy, albeit temporarily. Because if you eat, eventually you'll get hungry again. So you need to do it again. When you buy the new phone, Android phone, Samsung or Apple phone, it makes you happy at the beginning, but then the new one comes out, and then you need to renew that happiness. If it is, you can afford. You can afford that new phone, or you can afford that new bag or shoes, that's for sisters, bags and shoes for sisters. Or brothers, they feel they need new clothes or a new car. Constantly there's a renewal of these worldly possessions That you need to have the latest Car, phone, bag, shoes, whatever it may be So the person is seeking happiness where? The person is seeking happiness In these earthly or these worldly possessions That's where that person believes I can be happy So that person That person is seeking happiness in this world and doesn't seek happiness beyond that. Doesn't realize that a real happiness, a real happiness lies in something which you cannot buy, that you cannot purchase it, that you don't wear it, or that you don't drive in it, and that you don't live in it. That's not where, where real happiness is. That the heart, which is where that happiness and contentment is, there's only one thing that can make you happy, truly happy. A happiness which will stay with you, that you don't have to keep buying things to replace it. In fact, to renew that happiness is something very simple. 
It is simply having a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reminding yourself that the real happiness, the real existence is in the hereafter. This is the other type of people. Those other type of people are who? Those people who know we are sitting here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from them. Their real life is where it is not here. They see themselves as guests or travelers. They see themselves as travelers. And the Prophet وسلم, gave us an example in this worldly life. Kun fid dunya, be in this life ka'annaka gharib aw abir sabil. Be in this worldly life as though you are like a stranger or that you are on a journey. When you are on a journey, you take with you your suitcase. And there's only a certain amount of things that you can take with you in that suitcase. You can't put your house in the suitcase. You can't put your car inside the, new, the, the suitcase. You take the essentials. You take those things with you which are the most important for you on that particular journey. You will not be dragged down by things which are not important. Likewise, this worldly life, that you will not be dragged down by things which are not important, which will busy, busy you doing things which are not important, take you away from the priorities. These are a people who not only work in this life, but they also work for the hereafter. And you shouldn't make a mistake of forsaking and leaving everything on this earth. I don't want nothing. That you go around in torn up clothes. Okay? And that you eat bread and zabadi every day. Bread and yogurt every day. You seek to be poor. This is not what Islam told us. This is not what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. To, to be poor. Seek to be poor. No. Because... A man, he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and saying that one of us, we may get nice clothes. And I would like to wear nice clothes. Is this a form of arrogance? Is this wrong? Inna Allah jameel yuhibbul jamal. That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is beautiful and loves beauty. That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala may give you things as a ni'mah, as a blessing. And when those things come to you, that is when you need to be thankful to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And when you are tested with a calamity, with a loss, something that hurts your heart, this is where you need to be in a state of patience. You need to be patient. And even the Prophet ﷺ, he told us, Ajaban li mu'min. How amazing the matter it is for the believer. And only for the believer. This is only for the mu'min. That if he is afflicted with a difficulty, sabr, that he is patient. If he is given something which pleases him or her, then they are grateful. Always the believer is in one of these two. Don't make yourself one of the third, being absent-minded, forgetful. Either be patient or be thankful. And maybe in one day, you need to be patient and thankful ten times, going between the two. Maybe a moment comes to you, and you think about the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to you, and you say, Alhamdulillah, and you show thankful and shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only then to go home, that something has happened, and then you're patient. And then later on, Alhamdulillah, that problem has been fixed, and then you're grateful once again. This is a person who is working for the akhirah. They don't forsake this life because you should never forget your nasib, never forget your portion of this worldly life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Because it is this existence that you have in this worldly life that you will take with you and you will place in front of yourself and that you will be questioned about. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question you about that what you did in this worldly life. So a person who thinks that I'm going to stand on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and my argument is that I lived on khubz and zabadi my whole life. I lived on bread and yogurt my whole life. 
and I didn't care about anything that was given to me. This is not being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not about rejecting the ni'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is about being thankful. This is the person who works in this life with a view to benefiting more importantly in the hereafter. This is the kind of mindset that we should be having. Not those people who believe that happiness lies in listening to particular types of rap music which teach you the worst of manners, which teach you the worst of speech, which teach you to mistreat women, which teach you how to get hold of money in a haram way, and then the person says that this kind of thing doesn't affect me. Listening to this kind of words and music doesn't affect me. Of course it will affect you. Everything that you listen to will have an impact on you. The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do they have an impact on you? It is the kalam of Allah. It should have an effect on you. It should have a great and beautiful impact on you. Because we are a creation which whatever we listen to, whatever we see, whatever we eat, it has an impact. It affects you. This is the type of creation we are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us like that. We are emotional creatures. So whatever we listen to, whatever we see, are we not told to lower our gaze? Yes, because what you see will affect you. No matter who you are, whatever you eat will affect you. Don't drink khamar. Why? Because it's not only haram. Why is haram? Because the harm is greater than any good that you can think about. So it is important that we look at ourselves in a very simple manner. And don't try to complicate things. Because the moment you begin to complicate things that you know, are unique, there's nobody like me, which is true. You are an individual, there's nobody like you. It doesn't mean that you're not human. Okay, you're not Superman. You have human traits like every, every other human. You have an individual personality, of course you do. Your, your personality is unique. But you as a human, you are a human. And that you are affected like every other human in terms of what you listen to, what you eat and what you see. So those people who turn away from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us, remembering what makes us the best a nation, commanding the good, forbidding the evil and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment you turn away from that, that you are taking another path, a path away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then the person seeks happiness. The person will seek satisfaction somewhere else. And that the shaitan as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aduwun mubin, is a clear and open enemy to you. A clear and open enemy to you. Let me mention a story to you, a hadith narrated by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, how shaitan, how he works. And take this as a general principle. There were once upon a time, there were five individuals, five people who were particularly righteous. They were good people. Amongst the people, these people, they died. It is said, Wallahu Alam, that these five people, that they died, and that they died within a quite close, you know, particular time. These five people, they died. It was said to the people, Shaitan said to the people, these were good people. You don't want to forget about these people. Don't forget about them. They were good people. So make some pictures of them. Make things which will remind you of these people. So when you feel down, your iman is low, you can remember them. And then you'll feel better. So the people did that. So the people, they made pictures and some, maybe some idols of them, and they did not worship them. They did not worship them. The shaitan, he had a plan. His plan was, I'm not going to get you now. I'm going to get you later. Sometimes the shaitan, Iblis, has a long-term plan. Okay? Long term. So the time passed. And the next generation, they came. Then it was whispered and told to the people. And this was the time of Nuh, alayhi salam. It was said to the people, did you know that generation before you, they worshipped these people? 
They worshipped them? Yes, they worshipped them. So the people began then worshipping these people. What is one of the benefits, and there are many benefits in this, uh, from this narration, is that, that the plan of shaitan is not something which is maybe necessarily a short plan, short term, but maybe long term. Long term. That you may see something within yourself, that's okay, it's not going to affect me now. It has no impact on me now. But the plan is now, not to harm you now, but the harm will come later. That the harm will come later. Okay? For example, a person maybe who's a, the iman, they're trying their best. They're trying their best to establish their five daily prayers. It's a struggle that many of us face. To establish the five daily prayers. Okay, they try to stay away from haram and things like that. And then they start coming of age. 12, 13, 14 years old. Okay? Now they start wanting to have a phone. Okay? That, you know, that Nokia with just buttons and a, a really kind of black and white screen doesn't work anymore. I need a proper phone. And so they say to the parents, you know, I want a decent phone. The parent sees down the line and says, you know, that this person it will go through a difficult time if they have uh, this smartphone. Because then they will have all of this access to the social media. They will have access to watching all these videos, which are, is, you know, when they're on their own, they can see anything. And then you say no to the child. You say no, I don't want you to have your phone. And then they become upset and they don't see down the line. But as a parent, you do, you do see down the line. You see the potential harm of having such a device. That having this responsibility is a, a big responsibility for this young person. That they don't see the harm in it. But the parent or the one who has experience, the one who has seen, been around for a little while, sees that harm. For some of us, we may not see that haram, or that harm rather, the harm. We may not see it now. We may see it as something very small. But then over a period of time, the shaitan is slowly working on us. Slowly working on us. And eventually, you fall into that haram. Even to the extent that the shaitan, he hates you so much. He hates you so much that he would even be happy if you commit, if you done some form of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He'd be happy if you worshipped Allah. But as long as that, that you're gonna, when you worship, it's the very least worship that you're going to do. For example, he doesn't want you to, you, for you to offer any nawafil salah, voluntary prayers. Okay, he's not going to stop you at the moment offering your fard. So he doesn't, what he pressures you to, pressures you not to do that voluntary prayer because you're busy. So you get to the masjid late and there's no time for you to pray the sunnah. So you join the jama'ah late or one or two rak'ah is gone. So the time for praying four or two rak'ah before dhuhr is gone. And then the person says, am I allowed to make up my sunnah prayer? Am I allowed to make up my sunnah prayer? It's not necessarily giving you a ruling, am I allowed to make up, yes you can or yes you, or no you can't. Is this something regularly happening? Because if I, you know, somebody gives you the answer, yeah you can make it up inshallah. So then every time that the person comes to the masjid, leaves, leaves out the sunnah, and then joins the fadl, then makes up the sunnah afterwards. The shaitan is happy that you've done the very least. Even though you're going to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you've done the very least. And then he works on the next step of you then maybe missing the jama'ah altogether. So this is the adawa, the enmity, the hatred that the shaitan has for you. And especially now, where, of course, each era, each time, each generation of people is different from another. And it is, it is a common statement to say, we're living in a time that we've never experienced before. But of course, the generation before us okay, lived in a time that nobody experienced before as well. So each generation, if you like, is unique. But there are particular and special challenges that we do have that were not there before in that, that the entire world 
has become like a small village that you can have contact with one another so easily. You can make money. The issue of halal and haram is something else. But you can make money in so many different ways, it's unbelievable. You can be behind a screen, behind a screen and make money. This is how easy things have become. And when things become very, very easy, that you don't have to do very much, then you become lazy. And then you start to take shortcuts. And this is where then the people then they fall into, into, into the haram. So all that I mentioned at the beginning, or up until now, in that why is it that we find our shabab, our youth, whatever country you go to, that there are places like ghettos, where there's poverty, where there are lack, lack of education, the type of housing isn't really maybe what it should be. Most of the time you find Muslims, they're in these places. What can we do? What can we do to get ourselves out of that? For example, in the UK, that the Muslims represent about 5% of the population. 5% of the population. Okay? It's not very much. However, they represent something like 15 or 20 percent of the people in prison. Of the prison population, they make up nearly a fifth. What's going on here? Why is it that the Muslims are so small in number, comparatively, you know, it's made about what, three, three and a half million Muslims in the UK, amongst 65 million? But yet, yet we find one in every five people in prison is a Muslim. Why is this the case? And the why is it that we find Muslims are being affected by this other way of life which involves drugs and alcohol and taking advantage of women? All of these things which are purely in line with a person following their own desires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that it has been made within man to have a desire for or maybe their lowly selves if they're not controlled to go after money to seek happiness with the other gender in fornication billah. and by selling and involving them things just to make money because that's the bottom line isn't it whether it's alcohol or drugs or whatever the case may be they themselves might not take it, but the bottom line is that they want to, to have that money so they can then purchase the house or the car or the clothes, whatever the case may be. And again, as I said at the very beginning, what does it go back to? It simply goes back to that that person has become like a slave to their own desires, a servant of their own desires, seeking happiness. But the shaitan has deceived them so much that they believe that the happiness lies here. This is what will make me happy. So it is extremely important that children from the ages 6, 7, 8, very young, that we teach them what real happiness is. And that how what it means to be a Muslim. The people of Mecca tried to attack the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in many ways. If you like, the media at that particular time. Because we blame the media for many things. It didn't change then. It was the same thing in Mecca. Okay? It didn't have like news channels or newspapers, anything like that. No. They used to spread things by word of mouth. But they were all thinking, what can we say about this individual? The Prophet Muhammad What can they say? We can call him Majnu. We can call him. He's insane. He's crazy. But they know, you know what? He's not. He doesn't behave like a crazy man. Okay, we will call him a poet. A sha'ir. Yeah, but we know that what he says is not poetry. We will call him a kahin. Um, like a fortune teller. One who tells the future. But again, he doesn't do the things that, you know, the Quran that they do. We'll call him a sahir. A magician. 
Again, he didn't do things that a magician did. So they tried to attack him. But his integrity, his, his character was beyond anything that they could say about him. Whatever they said against him, والسلام, his character, the way he behaved, dissolved anything that they could say. So what did they end up saying? Then that, let's call him a sahib. Let's just call him a magician. Why? Because he splits families. It was the practice of some of the magicians at that time, okay, that they would separate husband and wife, or a father and the son. That the magician would do something, and that they'd place something within somebody to two family members to hate each other. And they said, this is what he's doing. This is what the, what the Prophet Muhammad is doing, is that the son will hate his father, or the father will hate the son. One who accepts Islam, the one who's still upon shirk, will hate him. So they tried to use the very best that they could in calling him a sahir. But yet still that failed. Because his character, who he was, superseded that. It was too much for what they, what they say against him. These are the kind of things that we need to instill in our youth. It is very important having conferences like this. It is very important having regular talks. But there must be a goal. There must be a hadaf. There must be a goal behind it. It is not about ticking a box that we had our yearly conference. It is not about ticking the box that we have a weekly class. It has to have a goal, a purpose. Because if it doesn't have a goal, if it doesn't have a purpose, then you are delivering information to people in a place that it is not needed. It is like you're throwing seeds on concrete. Those that they won't, nothing will grow. You need to know the needs of the people and then deliver the information that they need. The trials and the difficulties that we are going through, these are the issues that we need to speak about. These are the, these are the things that we need to tackle. Even issues, which is easy for us to say as Muslims, that a Muslim would never do that. And Muslims, we don't have that. Okay? I'll, I'll give you an example. You know depression? Depression. The person say, if he's a true Muslim, they can never have depression. If he's a true Muslim or she's a true Muslim, they can never suffer from depression. They dismiss it. They just say you have weak iman. Maybe there are halat, there are halat, there are situations where people may do have dep depression and they can't get out of it and they need professional help as well as spiritual, imani, Islamic help. Other issues like there are people who have particular ways of thinking which are the overzealous, the extreme. Maybe we dismiss it. We say it's only one or two people. Maybe it is. But maybe it's more. So what do we do? Or what are we doing about it? To deal with it. To, to speak about it. To be honest with ourselves as a community. What do we do? Or do we wait for things, for hap wait things to happen? And then we'll, we'll try to solve it. Other things like... Child abuse. Child abuse. Or domestic violence. These are things which you think, you know, Muslims don't do that. It can affect all communities. Domestic violence is a big problem. What do I mean by domestic violence? More often than not, that you will find that the husband or the father or whoever the male, the dominant male in the house is, is being violent with the women folk or the youngsters in the house. You know, not long ago, for example, that I received a call and it's like, I wish I never received this call. I wished, I said, Ya Allah, what I, you know, of course, this is what Allah subhanahu wa wrote for me, but I would have, you know, the call came to me, I had to do my best. But you think to myself, in future, you know, I don't want calls like this because I just don't know what to do. A girl of 14 years old is being beaten at home regularly by her father and by her brother. You know, alhamdulillah, the problem has been sorted out now. Alhamdulillah. So she has now run away to another house. What do you do? 
If she goes back, she will be beaten. If now she, they know, the, the, the father and the brother, that they, she's gone to another house and told other people, she's in trouble again. It's like there's no way out for her. She doesn't know what to do. These are problems within our community that we should not, okay, we should not just try to hide away. These are real issues and problems that some of us, that we are going through. And that as a community, it doesn't mean that everybody has to know everybody's business. No. That's not what I'm saying. That if there is a problem between in a particular household, it doesn't mean it has to be public news. But there may be ways of resolving that issue. Because if you don't solve these problems within our communities, then you'll find that our youth, they will then try to find a way out of that. And the majority of the time, their way out is what? Is then falling into crime. Is that they need to make some money. They need to find a way out, get their own place to live, have their own car. So how long is that going to take if I have to go to, you know, to college and then university and then find the job? I don't have time for that. So having a safe and secure home that parents, fathers, husbands alike are responsible over themselves and over whom they have responsibilities over. Kullukum ra' That all of you are like shepherds as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Wa kullukum mas'oolan and ra'iyyate And that all of you will be questioned about your responsibilities. That if we, if we really want to have the ability and allow Islam to spread on the lands, spread in the lands, it is extremely important that we fix our own homes. Every single one of us. Because all of us, as the Prophet said that we are like a bunyan. Like these bricks come together. We need to individually and collectively sort out our homes, only allow that what is pleasing to Allah to come into our homes, and anything which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, keep it outside. You have that choice. It's your home. That's the one place, that's the one place that you can put your key in the door, you can close it, and you have control to some extent of what happens within your home. Outside, you don't have any control. Or your control is, is, you know, minuscule. But within your home, you have a choice what happens. If then, the only place that you have some form of control over, that you're not doing that properly, then that will spiral and then impact everybody. And this is not a problem, if you like, that is not solved in 24 hours. But it is a mentality as Muslims that we need to have. We need to change our mentality as, as we are Muslims, what do we represent? Muslims doesn't mean that we're Muslims when we come to the masjid. And then when we step outside, that we become something else. That Islam is only worship, ibadat. That Islam doesn't affect the way that we deal with one another. We don't separate them. As Muslims, we, are, we have Islam in how we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have... Islam in how we deal with one another. Islam encompasses all of that. And the moment we start separating that, that I come to the masjid, I put my topi on, I put my hat on, and I make my salah, and then I go outside and I forget everything, then you've lost. Because that's not what Islam came with. That's not what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. The Prophet ﷺ taught us to be bad to be servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that time and also to be servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when with our families, when at work, when dealing with one another. This is what it means when we say Islam is a way of life that impacts in every aspect of your life as it should. But if we are just blocking off or choosing Islam to affect certain aspects of our life, and then we're going to make up and do our own thing at other times. Maybe we don't think about it like that. 
Maybe I don't think about that when I'm worshipping Allah, when I'm praying, when I'm fasting. I know I'm supposed to be doing that. But when I'm dealing with people, do I cheat? Do I deceive? Do I steal? Somehow I just, you know, I, I make excuses for doing that. It's like me believing in part of the revelation and rejecting the other. You know, I'm tailoring my own Islam. This is how Islam can fit into my life. This is how Islam fits in my life. This is how much of Islam I'm willing to accept. I should do it the other way around. This is Islam and I need to fit myself into it. And you do it the other way around. This is what Islam wants of me and I need to go into it fully. Completely. You enter yourself into submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely, not partially. Because when you do it partially, you do it bit by bit, bit by bit, you will tailor it to your own desires and your own weaknesses. And if you do that, you will never progress. So when we look at the state of ourselves, it is easy for us to look far away. It is easy for us to look far away. And we can see that house is burning and there's smoke. And subhanAllah, who's putting, who's putting the fire out? Who's getting the water to put the fire out in that house? And that person isn't turning around and realizing that their own house is on fire as well. They don't realize. Look, that person's house is on fire. What's going on there? That person's got problems. What's going on with him? She keeps doing this. Why is she doing that? What's wrong with her? The person has become alim about everybody else. Everybody, they know their business about everybody else. But themselves they forget. Their own homes they forget. Their own children they forget. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِكُمْ نَارًا Oh, you who believe. It's quite simple. Save yourselves. Begin with yourselves. Save yourselves and your family from the hellfire. If we don't do these basics, then inevitably that the person will just seek and do another thing. And then they fall into the haram. They fall into the drugs. They fall into the alcohol. They fall out of education. And then what is the future? What is the future? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correct our situation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be true servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the plots of shaitan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give steadfastness to ourselves and our wives and our children and the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. بارك الله فيكم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة